talk to a lot of different chiropractors who are getting ready to open a practice really either around the time they're getting ready to graduate or that first year after. And we come across things that we hear ourselves saying, I guess, over and over to help people figure out what they want to do to build an audience for their practice or the things they should be doing to build that audience and to have a really successful, you know, to open a practice to a large crowd. So today we thought we would discuss the five ways that you can get a patient and what you can do to increase that this month and through the end of the year. Yeah, so most people I talk to, they are averaging around 8 to 10 new patients a month. They're not super focused on it. They've kind of, they're, you know, doing whatever they can. It's kind of haphazard. There's no real plan. And so I came up with these five ways that you get a patient to show that it's it's actually very easy and that you can put focus where you need to to grow that number because I think it should be closer to 25 or more a month that you're getting new patients a month. So back in my retail sales life, one of the things that I was taught early on that has turned out to be true is that people buy things from people that they know, like, and trust. But it starts off with they need to know you first, and I see that that's the first thing on your list here, Haley. So take us through that. Sure. So the first people that are going to come into your practice are people you know. And some of these may be family and friends you feel more comfortable referring to other doctors, but they might be other people, parents of yeah, your kid's friends, that kind of thing. They already know you and they, you know, over time they've gotten to know to know you and like you and they trust you. And so they schedule an appointment to come in and based on all of that background. Yeah. You know, when I talk to people and I say, where are you thinking about practicing or where are you planning on practicing? And, you know, sometimes uh, if the person's in their middle 20s and they don't have kids or significant other yet tying them down, they're looking at going and exploring. You know, I've always wanted to live in the mountains or near the water or something like that. But, and then I ask, do you know anyone out there? And the reason I ask is I want to find out if they've already got a built-in network. And also a lot of times people, once they do start having kids and settling down, they realize they want to be close to home. But, but I, I let them know that, look, if you're going into a brand new place where you know where you don't know anybody, you've got to build a network. There's no one built in that already knows, likes, and trusts you. Um, so that's one of the things you, you need to consider is when you go where there's no one that you know, you're going to have to put in that much extra effort to be able to build that network. Whereas if you go back to where, you know near where you came from, there's a network of people there. Maybe it's your high school baseball coach or you know gymnastics coach or whatever the case is. That um, you know those people, you know a, a whole lot, you know, it's your church, it's, it's your tribe. Those people are already there and you sort of go and reacquaint yourself and, and plug yourself into the existing network. Yeah, and we did a podcast episode on networking, so I don't think we need to go too much into it. But know that you can't join a chamber and expect people to come just because you're a member of it. Just like you can't join a gym and think you're going to lose weight even though you don't go. So you have to fully immerse yourself in these places that you've joined or you see yourself being a part of and to to acquire patients that way that that – they meet you, they know you, they like you, they get to know you over time, and then they start coming in. All right. So I'm looking at this next one here. Um, five ways you get a patient. Their referral. Take us through that one. Okay. So one of the people from the first group refers in a friend, family member, neighbor of theirs to you because they know you and they're saying, hey, you know, if you have a back issue or whatever, you know, a knee issue, whatever the case may be, then they something they hurts. think of you. Yeah, something hurts. <laughs> and they think of you and they say, oh, my gosh, you have to go see my chiropractor. He or she's the best. So the second way, the first way is that the person knows you um, either through networking or they're your neighbor or friend. And then the second way is that one of those neighbors or friends referred that patient to you. One of the things I, I always like about referral-based practices, and that's how ours has been, is is that 
you've got a patient, A, let's call them, they're coming in and they are paying you for their services and then they refer in patient B and maybe patient C and D. And those may refer other people. So the person who's paying you initially, patient A, is referring in patient B and C who are also paying you and they are your best source of advertising. Whereas, you know, that's a warm lead um, from my days in sales, whereas a cold call is somebody that you don't know that you had to go send mailers out to or – um, you know, do a, a screening or something like that to bring in basically a stranger. The referral base is so is so fantastic. Also, when they are a warm referral like that, they are already there because a trusted friend sent them in or referred them in. And so their barriers and uncertainty has already been, you know, that no like and trust that a part of that's already been conquered. And it just makes the whole relationship, I think, better. Yeah, so if patient A refers in patient B, then patient A's already told patient B, this is what you you know, you'll expect. Um they take care of you like family. Their office is warm. I love the front desk person. They're already telling them how it's going to work, the culture in your office. And so patient B is going to decide, you know, this sounds like the right fit for me because they probably got three referrals. But if they choose you, then they probably felt like what that other person said made it a better fit for them to come to your office. So I like what you said about the culture of the office, and that's a perfect segue into number three. A patient might come into your office because they like your online presence. Why don't you why don't you talk about that? Yeah, so we talk about branding and how your branding should speak to your ideal patient, and that's the whole thing thing behind your online presence. So when somebody starts creeping the internets and they find your website, your Facebook page, your about page, they really get a sense of who you are and they feel like you're a good fit for treating them. So that's the third one is they like your online presence. The second one is that they were referral. And the first one is that they, they just already knew you. One thing I do want to mention about the online presence, uh, a lot of people mistake having, you know, let's say social media and advertising um, that, you know, that's going to be the ticket to getting new patients. They're going to get a huge return on investment. There's a a social media marketers contacted them and said, hey, if you pay me, I am going to get those patients in. You just watch. Maybe that will happen and, and maybe that won't. But just today I was reading a 2019 review, it was basically a survey of social media marketers, and they asked them the question about how they track a return of investment in marketing. And it said that only 44% of them really had a way to do that. Um, And that remains something that's really elusive, trying to track what you're getting from that. So when we're talking about your online presence, that includes, of course, social media, but your website as well. But know that really what you're doing uh, th- with that, is it necessarily having an ad that's going to bring people in? It's creating a community, just like Haley said, of people who are doing the online creeping to really get to know you and what you're all about before they even walk through your doors. Yeah. And if you aren't visible on Facebook, someone can't find you or they can't find your office on there or they can't find a website or they go to your website and there's not a picture of you. That's going to be an instant turnoff. So you really need to think about having a picture of yourself, you know, having your profile on Facebook visible and having your office visible and that you are consistently posting and you're true to who you are. So that addresses the online community. And that takes us to number five. No, four. This is four? Yeah. Oh, I can't count. I told you I'm bad at math. Okay. Uh, (laughs) Takes us to number four. They notice your community presence. Tell us about that one. Sure. So we, you know, we were really active in the chamber. We were always at the the town fair, at the chamber functions in town. The we hosted Santa Claus in our office. Those kinds of things would get people coming through our office. We've donated to the lots of money to the schools, and so we have, you know, a community presence. People come to us because our logo is in the, you know, in the, um, what's that? 
the it's at the football field at the high school or the email that we get every week from Marlowe School. Oh yeah, the newsletter from our uh-huh. our kids elementary school. I don't know what you call it, but yeah, their so weekly it, roundup. You know, and then we bring. You know, they have auction, so we bring several items to auction, and people know us because they know that we are giving to the school, and because they know we give to the school, they want to come into our practice and give back to us in and get the help they need. Yeah, and we, we talk about, we highlight those things on our website and in social media. We had a community outreach tab on one of our practices, and when we gave that donation check to High School Athletic Department, there was a picture of us with one of those giant checks, you know, handing that over to the athletic uh, supervisor. Um, we also hosted coat drives and school supply drives and food drives in our office during, you know, we partnered with local charities to do that, but each one of those things uh, is a press release worthy event, and then it just it's it's some it's a way to give above and ingratiate yourself into the community. You're taking care of the people in your community in one way by being their chiropractor, but this is help helping do greater good beyond just the people that you lay your hands on. So Rich and I really realized early on in our practice that these were the areas we really liked focusing on because when patients came in through these four ways that we've discussed already that they they know you they or tr- some they trust someone that knows you um, they've thoroughly researched your online presence or they see how engaged you are in the community those were the best ways because when someone came in having a good feeling about us, they followed our treatment plan and they continued care and they respected our opinion and they got better. And then they went out and they, they told other people about us. So those, I think these are the best ways to get people in the fifth way. Wait. Okay. Five does come after four. Go ahead. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the patient comes in from paid advertising and most likely some sort of discount is given. So they're coming in to you because the price is right, essentially. Yeah, and you have to be careful when you discount care. This isn't the episode where we're going to go into discounting and the legal ways to discount and, and things to do. And um, and I wouldn't necessarily say discounting, but maybe um, a gift certificate program where you're not actually discounting your care you are subsidizing that care. Um, And that's, again, a a subject for another podcast episode. But you might have, um, you know, you have to have the the person that's in the right place at the right time. So So there's three ways that a price shopper is going to come in. They were at the right place at the right time, and they got your discount. They found you on Facebook from your Facebook ad. Or they're a price shopper, so they're calling all around to see who's going to give them the best deal over the phone. Or they're a chiropractor shopper. So, you know, they're looking for a new one. And, you know, after three treatments, they're going to look for their next one. So these these patients are not the ideal patients that you're trying to bring in. And so what we're getting to today is that, you know, going on price, going on discount, that's not the way to get a patient into your office. Yeah, absolutely. Is, That's just the, the, the... It's the least effective way. Yeah. Back, you know, going back to my retail sales days, and I learned a lot of lessons from those days. That's why I share these. There was a, you know, someone would come in, they were going to buy, let's say it's a TV. And if you were a good salesperson, you were good at creating value and you matched the right person up with the right TV for their needs. What kind of shows do you watch? Is it sports oriented? Are you looking for something that's great? And this was back before there were flat screens and digital, but certain TVs were better for fast action as opposed to movies. And so you really wanted to put those, you know, the person and that particular item, the right match. You wanted to create that and instill value. But for other salespeople on the floor who couldn't, weren't as skilled at this, they just started what we call dropping their pants. They would drop the price, and that's the only way they could compete is on price alone. And I'll tell you, if you're competing on price alone, you're underselling what you're worth, what your value is. You're creating an appetite for that. I'll tell you, every time we ran some sale that was lower than the one we ran before, 
people would just wait for that again because that you you know there was no point. Why Not would, in our chiropractic office, but in, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in yeah. <laughs> back in the days of retail sales, you know, we did a buy one speaker, get the other speaker free, and uh, people quit buying speakers if they had to pay full price because they would just wait for the deal because we had shown them that why would you ever pay full price for that? So that's that's a race to the bottom, and that's why we put this last. It's just not the recommended way to to build value and to bring people people into the office. No, and for chiropractors, that patient isn't coming to see you. They are coming to you because of your price or your discount. And ideally what you want is you want people coming to see you because people who are coming to see you aren't so concerned about price. They're concerned about their care and they're concerned about the doctor. And so if you focus on the top, the first four things, then you are getting more quality patients. They're going to keep up with care. They're going to listen to you. They're going to respect you. Yeah. And looking at, you know, going back to what is it? Number two, their referral. If you start getting in the price shoppers as your patient base and they mm-hmm. they start referring in, who's it going to be? More price shoppers. And pretty soon you have a bunch of people in there who that's what they've come to know and expect. And you're stuck in that corner. No, oh, and if you don't bill your patients the balance of what they may owe you, then you'll become known as the chiropractor that doesn't collect payments. And then the patients who like that will send in their pay, pay, their friends who don't want to pay for treatment. So you have to be really careful about that aspect, I think. So I think we've done a pretty good job. Let's list them one more time. Number one, Haley, what is it? They know you. Number two? They were referred to you by someone they know, like, and trust. They like your online presence. And they like your community engagement. So using the first four ways, we've come up with some tips to boost your new patients using those ways um, rather than advertising or discounting your fees because that's not what we do and we don't think you should either. I like this first one. (laughs) I do too, because I feel like some of the chiropractors I talk to don't do it enough. I do too. And that one is meet more people. You have got to be meeting people everywhere you go. You have to go to events and meet people. Don't stand around looking at your fingernails or thinking about fishing on the weekend or how soon you can get out of there yeah you engage and meet people and be interested and be interesting and and the more people you meet and the more you connect with the more patience you're going to get from those connections uh get to know people better yeah so i think This is one thing, too, is that you want to go a little deeper in the relationships. It's far better to talk to a few people at a fair or a race or wherever you might set up a tent. It's much better to talk to fewer people deeper than a lot of people very shallowly because those people won't build a connection with you. Whereas if you talk to even just a few people and really build a connection with them, they're more likely to come in and see you or refer someone to you. The next one, become involved. And this is really easy. It just requires time, but I think you'll get just as much out of it. But you want to engage and do be part of the groups that you're in. Um, be in on a community or on a committee, a committee. A committee. Um, head up something, do something, be a part of it, be at the boot at their booth for the fair. We would, I was on um, the chamber board, and as part of that, I would be at their booth during the town fair, which was fun. Yeah, so become involved and uh, join a committee or board and help with an event. Those all go together. Oh, yeah, so those were all different things. <laughs> so, what else can you do? Well, you have. A current patient base there, ask them for referrals. So the way that I did that is once I got to know them and it helped them and they had seen what was going on, you know, with their condition and how chiropractic had improved it, 
it was pretty easy. Not the second they said it started feeling better, but I'd say around visit eight, nine, I'd say, is there anybody else you know who would benefit from this? And maybe there is, or maybe there isn't. Um, but I'd say, well, let them know we're here. And I would leave it at that. Uh, another thing that we always did and still do is send thank yous to patients who refer in. You don't have to for HIPAA. You're not going to mention their name, but you can say thank you for your trust in your recent referral to our office. Um, we appreciate that trust and you know we'll take the same great care of them that we do you or something to that effect. But there's a way to do that. Um, to to show that appreciation without violating any privacy rules. Yeah, and so you also want to ask for reviews. You don't want them to actually give the reviews in your office, but you know when they go home, you well, you when they're in the office, you can ask them if they would like to give you a review, and if they say yes, then you have a email that you send out to those people that that have said they would like to give you a review and it has all of the links to the different places you would like reviews at. You could do a video testimonial uh, as well, as long as you have them sign a release that you can, that, you know, that they are allowing you to do have that use of their, that audio and that video. But I've seen those as well, but the online reviews are really nice because they go, you know, they factor into Google's um, their overall ranking system. And so having more of those certainly helps. Yeah, and so does taking time to learn about social media because that's where it's all headed and you need to be on there. You need to know how it works and how you can share what you need to share so that people know you know, your brand, your culture, how you're supporting the community and they know that you're going to be a good fit for, for their care. And it... You know, just work a little bit on that a day. I know it can seem daunting, especially if you didn't grow up in social media. But if you do a couple of posts here and there and uh, always be working on those things, uh, maybe, you know, it's a post or two a day or three or four a week. But you want to have something new in the feed from time to time, pretty frequently, regularly to uh, to to keep people. You want to be in their minds. And that means you need to be in their feed when they're on their devices. Yeah, our last podcast episode was with an Instagram expert. So she shared a lot of tips about how you can grow your Instagram following and get recognized on Instagram for being the town chiropractor. So this next one I really like. It's meet neighboring businesses and build relationships with them. And for whatever reason, I find what other people's businesses are so fascinating. There are all kinds of people that we meet um, currently and when we were in Colorado as well that just – whether it was a restaurant or there was a – what was he, a metal worker – uh -huh. John, just fascinating. And they'll tell you all about what they do and how they do it and supporting them and their business and their causes and their mission and mentioning them in your online media presence. All of that really helps to bolster those relationships because small businesses um, usually, you know, we don't have big corporate backing and where we can just. You and know. we're all working alone. Yeah. We're, so we're, it's nice to have somebody to work together yeah. with. Or. There's not that corporate network. We're all solo or small groups. Yeah. And I think, you know, with us in Erie, we would throw chamber events together. So three neighboring businesses would have one chamber event and kind of come together, share the cost, the responsibility, and have, you know, the whole chamber come to the event and kind of synergistically build relationships that way. And another one that's a big part of the, the whole networking picture is just to build relationships in your community. That could be with a realtor, the uh, insurance agent next door, um, with the with the people that are in the hair salons. I mean, all of these people talk to a whole lot of other people, and it's nice to be somewhere in that conversation. Um, at least they know about you. They know who you are, and you know who they are. Mm-hmm. And another one we have is help with a school event. So if the – one of the things we did was we went in and we actually gave talks to the schools. We talked to the science classrooms. But you can help with the school carnival 
or we're going to host um, the daisies in our office. And so they'll come in. They're like Girl Scouts, younger Girl Scouts, and they'll come in and learn about health and wellness and visit our practice and actually a neighboring business that we've, you know, we work with. And so it works to get those the kids and the parents into our space and know that we're there if if they ever need us. And this one we actually said earlier, but I'll say it one more time because it's doesn't hurt to say it again. Help with a community event. Most communities have all kinds of things going on um, several times a year that you can be a part of and have a presence, whether it's a trunk or treat, uh, yeah. whether it's a bark in the park or jazz in the park or whatever they happen to be. But they're all over the place, and it's usually pretty easy to get a booth or go help someone, you know, volunteer to help another person with a booth. Yeah, so when I wrote kind of our notes for this podcast, I wanted to narrow it down to where your new patients would come from because new patients are the lifeblood of your practice. They're, you're not always going to keep people on maintenance care, and, and you need new patients coming in, and you want strong relationships with them and you want them the res- the mutual respect that they're going to follow the care plan and that they're going to get what they need from your practice to take care of them refer them out if they need be and and to to build your your patient base and it's funny because I was on a call today and I was we were talking about pricing the practice and and growing a new practice and I started going into the details of this talk because I think it's so important to understand that being genuine that meeting the people and building your practice with people who know like and trust you is far stronger than dropping your prices, giving discounts or Paid, using paid advertising to bring people in. And so I think, you know, going through that phone call and utilizing what I had written for this to explain to them why the this is a, a better way to do it, it, I realized how beneficial it can be for people to listen to the, to the points and to build their practice using these techniques. And I was on a call today as well. And this person at a, a kind of a, the other side of this had bought a practice, um, and but doesn't really do any net personal networking or anything like that. Has spent some money on Facebook ads and some other forms of advertising, a mailer, and isn't getting hardly anything in the form of new patients. And uh, and I said, well, what's standing between you and doing you know more? more uh, advertising and he said oh i just don't have the money for it and i said well you need relationship base which it doesn't take a lot of money for it takes some time and if you're not having that many you know some planning you might have to work on the weekends um or put in some extra hours but you need to get out there and do that and so that was a misconception there's the only thing i can do to get new patients is pay someone to go bring them in well that's not true what you need to do is go out and form those relationships yourself and focus on the relationship side instead of mailers or the next person who's going to promise you a ton of social media patients if you pay them whatever. No, and I think we've been through both aspects of that. You know, when we first started our first practice, we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of time. And so that's how we built that practice. And then when we bought the Kansas City practice, we had more money than we did time. And so we started doing the mailers and the, you know, dropping off at the post office for them to, to send them out. And it, the return is not there. I don't recommend it. I think the relationship based, the meeting people, the getting in your community, all of that trumps any of the um, spending money. Well, I think I think we're good here. I think we yeah. covered a lot of good ground and made some hopefully good points. We think we did. Hopefully you'll agree. But I think that wraps this episode. <laughs>